55. Leviticus 25, as we turn in our Bible this morning to open the Word of God together and study the Word of God, even the prophetic Word of God this morning. Leviticus 25 is where we're going. Our topic this morning, special topic, Donald Trump, Pope Francis, and Ted Wilson, a religious liberty crisis. I'll repeat that. Donald Trump, Pope Francis, and Ted Wilson, a religious liberty crisis. You will find that among us as a people, there is very little hurt in these last days, in these even, let's say, the last 15 years, much less 10 years, on the topic of religious liberty. It is seemingly apparent to those with prophetic eyes that the idea and the promotion and the warnings that we at one time heard along the lines of religious liberty are slowly eking down to but a whisper among us. And even the idea of why the topic of religious liberty as a topic will be presented in churches or even presented by a denomination of people seems obscure. It seems cloudy. Why would we do that? Why are we getting involved in that? Just preach Jesus, some would say to you. But we want to understand this morning from a quick study, prayerfully a quick study, why the topic of religious liberty is so important to every Christian, especially those bearing the name Seventh-day Adventist. Why religious liberty is an issue that we all must understand keenly. As much as we understand the gospel, we need to understand religious liberty because religious liberty and the gospel are inseparable. Religious liberty and the gospel are as inseparable as the medical missionary work and the gospel. Some cannot see that as I make that, that statement now, but prayerfully in a few moments you will start to see this divine truth. But before we go into that, I want to make a few terms, a few words, a few ideas clear as we see where we're going and why we even have a title such as Donald Trump, Pope Francis, Ted Wilson, a religious liberty Christ. What, what do these men have to do with anything concerning religious liberty? And what is, for some, what is Religious liberty. I just want to read something. I just wrote down a few things. I want to just touch on these things. I want to. I haven't written down because I didn't want to forget any of these things. Students of prophecy, those that are students of prophecy, especially that understand the three hundred message, are able to see and understand the significance of the rise of Roman Catholicism from a historical, prophetic. Uh, I'll even say social standpoint. And when I say so social, because not only do we understand things prophetically about the rise of what we know as the Roman Catholic Church, or the at one time called holy, so-called Roman Empire, but also we understand historically, even to this day, they still remain evidences of what this power did when it came to full strength around the year 538 AD. But socially, socially, when we deal with human rights, the rights of every person, of every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every person. When we deal with human rights, we understand in our age of this world, in this last few thousand years, that historically, not only prophetic, but historically and socially, Roman Catholicism, the Inquisition, the Order of Fe, and its worldwide efforts through the powers of Europe stand on parallel when it comes to human rights abuses, the destruction of human life based on religious preference, even a preference of Catholicism over any other religion or even the idea upon the earth. They also understand that this church called Roman Catholicism, called the papacy, this power that was both a government as well as a religion, students of prophecy also understand that this power in connection with the monarchies of Europe, Spain, Portugal, France, and so on, were on the verge of establishing what I call a old world order. You ever heard the term new world order? Yeah. The new world order is called a new world order verily because it is a new installment of what was the old world order. And those that are students of prophecy understand keenly that the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, what was called at one time the Holy Roman Empire, was on the verge of securing 
a old world order or a global system of spies, of governments, of prisons, secret and, pu and public, of uh, laws and restrictions and working agreements between these various countries to close down all human freedoms not afforded by the Pope of Rome. This world order and the re re reduction and even elimination of religious liberty and even human rights was almost secured except for one singular movement. Now again, those that understand prophecy, especially those that understand the book of Revelation, they understand that yes, in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation, especially eight and nine, it deals with the trumpet. The trumpets talk about the three woes. And of those woes, the Mohammedan empire, the rise of Islam, did play a role in keeping the papacy from establishing a world order. We understand that, but we're not dealing with Islam. We're not dealing with the power that we know as the Mohammedan empire, whether it be the Ottoman Empire, all the various tribes of the sons of Ishmael, we're not dealing with that power and its role in thwarting this world order. They were significant, but they are not as significant as this one I'm talking about right now. Also, though the, the book of Daniel, sorry, the book of Revelation 11, they understand that in the 11th chapter of Revelation, a power is brought to view that the great controversy calls a new manifestation of satanic power. And what we understand as the age of reason or the, the, <clears throat> the Jacobin uh, movement of France, what we understand as the, the movements, and we'll see this point as being important, the movements of so-called liberty that came as a result of the French Revolution spawned what we know as socialism, communism, and many movements that completely changed the governmental structure of the entire world. All the governments of the world were shaken by this movement of Revelation 11. As a matter of fact, all the monarchies of Europe and even some parts of Asia, we talk about you know, uh, Russia and so on, were overthrown in a short order of time as a result of the teachings and movement that came out of the French Revolution. The Bible calls it a beast or a nation, a government, a structure. The Pentecost Revolution calls it a new manifestation of satanic power. And this movement also played a large role in eclipsing the power of the papacy for a time and keeping them from securing a world order or a global control that was unbreakable. We're not dealing with that power though, even though significant as it was, it's role. We're dealing with something dealt with in the book of Revelation chapter 2. The book of, dealing with Sardis. We're dealing with a movement that came up even during the time of Thyatira, one of the seven churches. We're talking about a movement called the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation did more to keep the papacy from establishing a world order than any of the other movements. Significant. Henry Kissinger in his recent book mentioned an incredible quote. He mentioned that the papacy, or I don't want to say the papacy, he said that the, the, the idea or the establishing of a world order was interrupted, he said, by Protestantism. He said the two swords of the papacy or Catholicism and the state were interrupted by Protestantism. Protestantism as the gospel they had and the works that that gospel brought about that we see so little of today. And these principles of the gospel and the working out of them in the lives of those that had it found themselves into the governmental structures of those nations that embraced the gospel just as those that embraced the French Revolution brought so-called so principles of liberty, they thought, into their government and swept out monarchies and also the papacy. Protestantism also swept out the papacy. They didn't want popes or kings, but they brought about an idea of liberty and equality that was based not upon the age of reason or the power of the mind or ancient paganism. It was based upon the gospel. We want to see these two powers contending as we go through this series of talks on religious liberty. We can't deal with all today. But Protestantism, are we still together? Amen. Protestantism was the main agent that throughout all Europe and then into all the world played a, and gave truly 
a part of that deadly wound. Yes, we know that the powers that were in France, the, the, the powers that were under the auspices of the French government and so on, had a role in that deadly wound. But that deadly wound would not be possible if that sword of Protestantism did not continue to keep that wound in effect and also create a weakness in the papacy that that wound could be given. Protestantism was the issue that changed the entire world. So, brothers and sisters, I have a question for you. Because we have a title that says Donald Trump, Pope Francis, Ted Wilson, a religious liberty crisis. Why, why, why use these individuals as a symbol or a, a issue, why not just deal purely with religious liberty? It is imperative that you see where we are and what these individuals and the organizations or the movements or the governments they represent play and show us as it comes to the coming of a National Sunday Law and even the end of time. Because, brothers and sisters, if we just said, and we just, in a short, cursory way, explained some of the history of the last 2,000 years, and showed that Protestantism gave a deadly blow, if it were, to the governmental structure, the, the ideas and philosophies, even the ability to freely proselytize of Catholicism. As, it, as Protestantism was on the ascendancy, Catholicism was on the what? Descendancy. Anything that was Protestant or anywhere where Protestants had power and got schools and were teaching and had churches, Catholicism was in the retrograde. Are you following me? Amen. Do we see Catholicism on the ascendancy? Yes. Do we see the Catholicism even schools, and universities and churches on the increase? What does that tell us? The restriction or elimination of human rights, let's deal with this. The, human, the restriction or elimination of human rights or human freedoms is the natural effect of a society where Protestantism and the gospel experience and understanding they had, these Protestants had, is in the retrograde. Mm -hmm. So when we see the restriction, the elimination of human rights, which is human freedom, human liberties, or religious liberty. Liberty means freedom. When we see these things being eroded, not just in America, but also all over the world, what we must understand if we saw the rise of Protestantism and its global effect is that this is telling us that the idea of Protestantism, or the name, has no power. If I go out and put some rat poison out, rat poison, and I see, when I flip the lights on at late at night, rats sitting back and, and just eating and so on. I said, man, this, uh, they, they're carrying bags of the rat poison and, and dragging the rat poison out to their nest. And I go and say, oh, women, that's not rat poison. That's corn. You see, I thought it was rat poison. I even called it rat poison. But it was the very thing that it was actually something good for them. What we call problem today is nothing like the Protestantism of the old time. That's why the Great Controversy is so important to us, Amen. to show us what true Protestantism is, especially for those that are supposed to be the Protestants of Protestants. So, brothers and sisters, when we see waterboarding and various forms of torture being a, a platform for a candidacy, what does that tell us? When we see all over the world human rights, we see slavery, on the rise in the world again. Both human and sexual trafficking and also just out and out slavery on the rise again. So much so that even the UN is talking about it. Human rights, civil rights, religious liberty being restricted. What does that tell us? As Protestantism and its gospel is in the retrograde, Catholicism is in the ascendancy. And the establishing of that world order is eminent. Because what stopped the world order? True Protestantism. 
and cause the de de degrade of Catholicism. So if this Catholicism is coming back, coming stronger and stronger, Catholicism, is, I'm sorry, Protestantism is getting lesser and lesser, that means that this world order establishing a worldwide system of the same type of governments, idea of uh, surveillance. You know what this word surveillance means, right? Mm -hmm. We have that cameras all over looking so on to so-called show us where traffic is going or the lower crime. But brothers and sisters, it's also used for surveillance, to watch, to see if crimes are happening or to see what you're doing or to remove the liberty, the freedoms you have to be secure in your person, your thoughts and your effects. It's being removed. And what would the Protestant Reformation been like in the old, if they had cameras everywhere, not just human spies, if governments were as we are today, moving back toward an idea where you're guilty before proven innocence. You see, the whole idea of Protestantism reversed that, so that you were innocent, or the idea of innocence is afforded to you before you are proven guilty. This is the old world, and we're sliding back toward this, thanks to the Patriot Act, and various things that we see where all these various freedoms that were fought so hard for and people were martyred for are being removed in the sake of freedom or security or having peace of men. Men's hearts failing them for fear so much that they give up liberty for security. We know that this world order is eminent if we see this happening. And if this is true, what does that say about America under Donald Trump? The role and the power of the papacy under Pope Francis and even the power or validity of Seventh-day Adventism under Ted Wilson. This world order is approaching, brothers and sisters. It's approaching. And I would like to, in just a few moments, a few final moments, lay this foundation Give us an understanding of what we're looking at and why we're dealing with this topic and then show and explain to a small degree religious liberty because we're going to go over a period of time and explain this more and more. Let's deal with these three groups. Number one, Pope Francis. Just in a few seconds, let's just deal with this. Pope Francis is the Pope of Rome. You do understand that. You know that, right? Yeah. Is Pope Francis a Jesuit? Yes. Okay. Do you understand that the stated mission of the Jesuit order, both anciently and even today, is the re-establishment of papal supremacy? Yes. You understand that? Yes. The re-establishment of the papal supremacy is the role of the Jesuits, whether their schools or their seminaries or their, no matter what arm or agency or auxiliary or mechanism of the Jesuits, their role, their purpose is the re-establishment of papal supremacy by the removing of all the effects and power of the Protestant Reformation. That's their studied and, and avowed aim. And for a Jesuit to sit at, in the papal chair of the church, of which they're supposed to return all power to, that is ominous. There was something called Vatican II in the 60s. And the purpose of Vatican II was re-evangelization. What does re-evangelization mean? Evangelization means to go and evangelize. Re-evangelization means taking back all that Protestantism has taken. Mm -hmm. And how can you enter a strong man's house unless you do what? Bind. First bind or even kill the strong man. And kill him through celebration, pulpit exchange, and all this idea of, of unity and celebration and ecumenism that Vatican II was supposed to bring about. This is what we see. And brothers and sisters, when we look at the idea of this, this world order, if the Jesuits plans to reestablish this papal supremacy, and we see it happening. We see all the world wandering after the beast. Aren't the Jesuits' steadied, vowed mission being accomplished? Yes. Don't they have a Jesuit sitting in the very papal chair at the very head of the papacy to bring this about? Mm -hmm. Is not destruction of Protestantism almost complete? If this is so, brothers and sisters, are we not in a religious liberty crisis? 
Pope Francis com uh, uh, called or spoke or said or put forth an idea of a year of jubilee. And that year of jubilee ends this year with the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, meaning he's ending the Protestant Reformation. And we'll see the importance of the jubilee in a minute because again it deals with the principles of religious liberty. So with this man, this person in place, what is he doing? He's establishing this re-evangelization. Re He's establishing this new world order. And by announcing a jubilee, he said, it is here. It is time. I'm opening the holy door. You have a little bit of time to get back into the mother church mm -hmm. before I deal with you, not as a father, but as an enemy. Mm -hmm. And as this is going on, what is Seventh-day Adventism doing under Ted Wilson? We've talked about and heard the idea of revival and reformation, which should bring us back to true Protestantism. Have we seen it? Or have we seen more dialogue with the UN between the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the UN? We see more cooperation between the UN, the United Nation. I thought we were supposed to be separate from United Nations, church and state divide. I thought that we're not supposed to get involved in those kinds of things. We have a role to play, but I thought we had a spiritual role. Even in our, in our papers, we had a representative to the UN that speaks in our papers all the time, giving us a worldview or a view of a perfect world where we give out blankets and water and so on and do all this good work that the UN wants us to do. The various governments want to do. Not steps to Christ. No, no, no. That's a separate word. We kind of keep that on the back burner. What is this revival information? Is this revival information the kind that would be in the same position that Protestantism of old was? And what does the resurgency of the papacy and its coming back to power say about the so-called Protestant power of Adventism? Where is this revival information? What does that mean? Are we, if this is showing the Seventh-day Adventist Church to be basically impotent, is this showing a religious liberty crisis? Since they had the message of the seal, since they had the message that will keep us from getting the mark of the beast, isn't this a religious liberty crisis? The very headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in America. And who's the president now? Donald Trump, right? Now, not to say that Obama was any better, because Obama still had to kill us, did he not? Did Obama do anything different from Bush did? No. He was more eloquent. The security apparatus that Bush put in place under the Patriot Act, Obama increased. The people that were on the kill list that Bush had that were being killed by drones, Obama increased. The killing of even U.S. nationals without trial both by drone initially and also a law that he passed before he left that gave the power the actual presidential right, the power, the legal power, to without imp with impunity sur uh, kill or we say eliminate U.S. nationals that are supposedly terrorists abroad. This is now the law of the land. So I don't say that Obama was any different from the Republicans that, that were formed. We're not dealing with that with Trump versus Obama. We're dealing with the fact that on his platform, trying to be the President of the United States, he said that waterboarding, torture, and he said a blank of a lot worse is what he's going to do when he comes to office. How does that fit into human rights, religious liberty, and the principles that we see? You say, well, these people are terrorists. We have to deal with them. Brothers and sisters, the principles of the gospel can only be seen where the gospel rules and reigns. And America was established on the principles that were Protestant. And the, 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 the retrograde of the Protestant element in America and Christianity and the gospel, both in the secular Sunday Protestants and even now in, among Seventh-day Adventists, is causing a society, a societal problem where with no witness, there can be no true holding to those principles. There must be a switching from the lamb-like voice to a dragon voice. And because here in America, we don't want to give a place of refuge to refugees, 
We want to torture and use and very, very violent methods to try and extract information from individuals we believe are our quote unquote enemies or strangers. We want to close up. All these things have prophetic significance and especially show that the idea of religious liberty and human rights are being destroyed as a result of the gospel and the principle of the gospel not having its power. And I would even suggest to you very, very surely from this study today that as the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth, these things have to become worse and worse and worse. So, shall we study for a few moments? That was just an introduction. Shall we study for a few months and let's examine what religious liberty is or human liberty or human rights. What are these things that we study the word of God? Because God is a God of free choice, of love, and of setting the captives free. Do you believe with that? You don't believe that. Does God believe in setting the captives free? Amen. What does the Ten Commandments say? It says, I am the Lord thy God, which have left you in that cell. Hey, you, got, you and your own, get a lawyer. I am the Lord thy God that have brought thee out of the land of, out of the house of, out of the prison house. Deliverance. What's another word for that? Something with the F. Freedom. The Ten Commandments begins with the realization and even the, the power of freedom. The Ten Commandments are not for people in bondage. It's for people that are free. The basis of God's government is based upon freedom. What kind of freedom? Religious freedom. The foundation of God's throne is religious freedom. Shall we study? Amen. Let's go into the Word now. Leviticus 25. I did enough speech of fine. Let's, let's look at the Word now. Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25 and verse 10. Let's see what it says here. Because the Pope called for a jubilee. Who can call a jubilee? Anybody? God's the one that set up the jubilee. So to take the role and say, you're going to pronounce your own jubilee, you're standing in the place of Christ. And you're doing things that are against Christ. That's called antichrist. You didn't get that. Just think about it. It'll come to you. Leviticus 25, Leviticus 25 and verse 10 says this. Note the word concerning the jubilee. And listen carefully to the language. Verse 10 said, and you shall hallow the what? Okay, we're not there. Leviticus 25 verse 10. You shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim what? What's another word for liberty? Uh, we shall proclaim freedom to who? Throughout all, how much of the land? All the land. But not the church, right? All the land, right? Yes. Hmm. All the land. Unto how many of the inhabitants thereof? All. Wait a minute. Not, not the sinners now. Not people that are evil. Just to some people. How much of the land? All. God was going to give all the land freedom? He was going to give all the people freedom? Just the church people, right? Just the good people. Just the health reformers. Just people that, you know, ate right, dressed right, and the people that fit. Just only they get freedom, right? Only they should be treated nice. Only they should be loved. Only they should be respected, right? Everyone else, hey, they're sinners. They get what they, you can get what you get. No. He proclaimed liberty to all the inhabitants of it. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his... In other words, those that have lost their possession, whether it be money, whether it be some type of, of wealth, even a, a home, he, if he had lost it through some means, it was not only freedom, but also release. If he had incurred some type of debt, it would be forgiven, cleared. And he would be reunited with his family. Even the, the social separation would be remedied through the jubilee, which is a type of the gospel. Do you see that? Amen. Now this idea of the jubilee has a understanding that's trying to be reframed or reinterpreted in this generation through what the Pope is doing right now. But unless you understand the principle we study this today, you can't clearly see it. Only God can call it Jubilee. And the Jubilee was setting the captives free. Reuniting the dispossessed to his possession. Reuniting families. All this was accomplished through the Jubilee. You might even call it, or it's being called today, here's a term that people don't like, it's called a redistribution of wealth. Ever heard that term before? Yes. A redistribution of wealth. It's called a canceling 
of debts. Eliminating fiduciary responsibility. It's a big word there. Now, if this is in the Old Testament, was this also Jesus' work to proclaim liberty? Was Jesus' work, was the mission of Christ to do the same work throughout all the land, meaning all the earth, to every person? Let's see. In the book of, let's look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look at the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. You'll remember from our last study this same scripture, Isaiah 61. Isaiah, what chapter are we looking for? 61. Isaiah 61. Let's, let's make a little quickness now. Isaiah 61. Let's see exactly what Jesus' mission was and how this mission came upon him and how it comes upon us if we understand the scripture. In Isaiah 61, the Bible says this. Isaiah 61. We read it last time we were studying together. Isaiah 61 and verse 1, the Bible says this. Isaiah 61, 1. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Isaiah 61, 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord is where? Uh, how do you know? Then the verse says, because it's on some criteria now. The Spirit of the Lord become because the Lord hath anointed me to do what? Preach the good tidings or the good news. The word tidings mean news unto the He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim, what's that next word? Liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Brothers, have we read that before? We're concerning the gospel, right? This is the gospel, and the gospel is inseparably tied together with the proclaiming and the working toward and the establishing, the, the, the accomplishing of what? Liberty, which is freedom. It's the foundation of the gospel. Freedom. And when we look at the work of Jesus, Luke 4 says it. We can look at there if we want to. In Luke 4, I think it's verse 18. We, let's read that. Let's read that just for the sake of time. In Luke 4 and verse 18, when Jesus began his public ministry and he went into the temple, they handed him the book of Isaiah. And what scripture did Jesus read when he read the book of Isaiah on that awesome day opening his gospel ministry? The very passage we just read. Notice what it says in Luke 4. Luke 4. Jesus' mission was the proclaiming of liberty or the acceptable year of the Lord. Or of the setting of free, setting free prisoners. Binding up the world broken hearted because they had been separated from family. From their true, in their, even their, their true father. There was a reuniting, a, a forgiving of debts, or even of sins. In the book of Luke, Luke the fourth chapter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke 4 and verse 18, the Bible says this. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's reading Isaiah 61. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive. captive. Deliverance means set free. Recovering a sight to the blind to set at, what's that next word? Liberty. Liberty them that are bruised. Here again we see in the reading thereof, Jesus again said that this was fulfilled in their ears. Verse 21, this is fulfilled in the ears. What? This proclaiming of liberty, of delivering of captives. This is all proclaimed in Christ's ministry. And not just the Old Testament, this was a type in the Old Testament of what we see in the New Testament, under Christ. Now, when we look at that, brothers and sisters, why is it that, again, in Isaiah 61 and also Luke 4, all this idea of liberty and freedom and deliverance is connected over and over again with the idea of the Spirit of the Lord. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because I'm able to do these things. I'm able to do these things because of this Spirit. And, or, and you might say, without the Spirit, I can do what? Nothing. Why the Spirit so important? Because Jesus had said over and over, He came to do whose will? Father's, the Father's will. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He didn't come to do His own will. And as He came and finished the work, He said He went to go away and He must send, it's expedient for us, He sends another comforter that He may abide with you. It's only through the Holy Spirit that God dwells in us and the work of Christ is accomplished upon the earth. Even through us, even in all the world, the work of love and peace and freedom and liberty, whether the person claims to be of Allah or Buddha or whatever, whether they are evil or good, any good, any true, any freedom comes by the working of the Spirit of God in the world. Every good and perfect gift comes from? You don't believe that, though. You mean he? This guy over here? Who had just happened to do something? You mean that? It's the Holy Spirit that moves upon the heart to do right and wrong. It's the Holy Spirit. We have a choice in the choosing one way or another. You know, it's amazing. I keep on saying it over and over again. We look at Luke 4 and study this. I've seen it over and over and over again, especially when she was younger, even to this day, 
going out with my daughter and seeing some of the most hardened, unpromising uh, looking individuals that seem so hardened, I mean with tattoos and piercings, they're just mean looking at all the different trappings of clothing that seem like they are violent or in the gang. These people completely melt, brothers and sisters, at the idea that a little child would just wave at them. Or blow a kiss. Or seem happy to see them. And just the whole demeanor that seems so abrasive or so, so, so evident of a rough life or of hatred or of anger or of, or of pain in their lives. The idea of love sparks something in there. I'm talking about human love now. This is not the Holy Spirit. This is human love. That the whole demeanor changes. Brothers and sisters, the power of love. They may seem unpromising on the out exterior, but the Holy Spirit is able to use various means to awaken in them love, even to bring them to repentance under the right situation. Because God wants to proclaim liberty to all. 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 The most, the most downtrodden sinner can make a right decision. With the Holy Spirit working upon them. And when we look at the book of 2 Corinthians 3, this is why. 2 Corinthians 3. Looking for the 2 Corinthians now. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at the scripture. Very powerful scripture. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17. You know it. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17. Why is it all evident where the Spirit is? Because of 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17 says this. It says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Oh, you don't get this, brother and sister. It says, The Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we can say that the work of Jesus Come in this world. The, God, God, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not. Perish. But how would they not perish? Because the Bible says this spirit came upon him to do this work to save people. Or the spirit gave him power to give liberty. The whole purpose, the whole mission of Christ was liberty. To give liberty. Because where the spirit of God is, there is. Liberty. Then how is it that we claim to have the Holy Spirit and we are so restrictive? Why are we so easily agitated when people do things that they have the right to do? When people express their own opinion. That is so stupid. Why are we so, why are we so antagonistic towards someone else's freedom? Now again, there's a, a limit to everyone's freedom and right because again, you can't trample on other people's rights. But again, if we possess or are possessed of the Holy Spirit and have a peace that the world cannot take away, why does it seem to be so easily taken away? Because again, no gospel, no liberty. No gospel in the world or no power of the Spirit in the world, no liberty. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, all these powers, pagan powers, showed. A restriction of religious liberty. But as the Spirit moved, the Holy Spirit was able to move upon monarchs, kings, to try and give liberty to certain subjects. You saw in the story of Esther, liberty was given in a pagan empire to religion. Daniel was taken out of the, out of the pit and promoted in a heathen country. Where the Spirit of God is, there's what? Hmm. You know the text, Galatians 5.1? Have you read Galatians 5.1? It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the what? Liberty. Liberty. Wherewith Christ has what? Made you. made you free. And be not entangled. What's the next word? Again. Again with the yoke of Bible. That's Galatians 5.1. You might want to turn there if you want to. I'm not going to go turn there now, but I want you to look at that text in your mind. Stand fast, therefore. In other words, stand fast means don't move anywhere. Stand fast, therefore, where? In the liberty, because Christ gives liberty. He gives freedom. The gospel gives freedom. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Wherewith Christ has made you, because liberty is what? Freedom. And be not entangled again with the yoke of... What does that tell us? That means that, because that word again, that means where we were. Or the sins that we are part of, or the or the, the 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 situation of sin that we were brought out of into liberty, that was bonded. It says, "Be not entangled 
again with the yoke of bondage. Brothers and sisters, we see a great controversy here. We see the gospel and freedom on one side and sin and bondage on the other. And we see, if we study the word of God, a battle between these two opposing powers throughout time. Between sin and the gospel, between freedom and bondage. Or freedom and slavery. And even under the God. See, when the great controversy calls uh, the power of Revelation chapter 11 a new manifestation of satanic power, the, one of the reasons why is in Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and all these different powers, uh, the governments of those powers were ruled by Satan and made no, mo, it, no imagination or no, no uh, uh, pretense to have religious liberty. They, they rolled in blood and warfare. They loved these things. But this power that we see in Revelation 11 coming up, for those who understand that chapter, will be a new manifestation because Satan's going to flip the script, as they say. He's going to use his counterfeit in a greater way and try to establish a power or different governmental structures or even social movements that will profess or give the idea of this liberty. In other words, man, the devil said, you know what? This idea of liberty is whooping my behind. I'm getting whooped all about the head with all this liberty stuff. I can't, if I can't beat it, I best join it. And that's why when you talk about the, the age of reason, what happened to the French Revolution, if you remember reading in the book Great Controversy, in that chapter it talks about they had a woman of ill repute that was taken from the town and paraded through the street and they called her the goddess of reason or lady what? Liberty. liberty. Lady Liberty, and she was supposedly their god or the symbol of their movement. Lady Liberty, a light to all people. And what does the light? That light was Illuminism or the power of mental knowledge of all the pagan mysteries and all the, the mysteries of the ancient times. Lady Liberty, what's in New York Harbor? <laughs> Lady Liberty, with their torch out to illuminate all, where they come from? France. Because, oh, this is, this is talking about American liberty. Oh, no, it's not. It's talking about that liberty of Revelation 11. That's what it's talking about. So when we understand history, we see even prophetically connected with it, all these movements and what they're really talking about. What is this idea of liberty? Because Satan has come with a new manifestation to take the idea of liberty and give it in a false concept. You say, are you making this up? No, it's biblical. Because even in the, in the New Testament, Paul spoke of individuals under the power of Satan that had the same counterfeit to try and tell people, oh, I'm giving you liberty when they themselves were in bondage to sin. You don't believe me. Look at the book of 2 Peter. What book are we looking for now? Oh, when we put the scriptures together, isn't it so clear? It's very clear when we put the scriptures together. But many people don't understand religious liberty or religious freedom or even human rights from the Bible. In the book of 2 Peter, it says this. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter, what chapter are we looking for? 2 Peter 2 and verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Note the word of God. It says, while they promised them liberty. liberty, communism, socialism, all these social movements, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of or sin. For of whom a man is overcome... Of the same is he brought into bondage. bondage. While they promised them freedom. Oh, I'm going to give you civil rights. Oh, but there's something attached to that. Black Lives Matter. Oh, yes, they do. But there's something attached to that. Women's rights. Oh, amen. Amen. But something attached to that. Because the individuals that are behind these movements have the same philosophy, principle, and the idea of liberty of Revelation 11, not Luke 4. The idea of this new manifestation of satanic power as opposed to Isaiah 61. That liberty that we see spoken of throughout the scriptures is not the same liberty. It's the liberty of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. It's a liberty in sin. In other words, I need to have the freedom to sin and the ability of you to accept me in sinning in your home or around you and you need to help me sin. 
because that's my right. If I want to have a, a <clears throat> same-sex relationship with someone, you need to help me do that. If I want to love little boys and little girls, it's coming, brothers and sisters. You need to receive that. If I'm a woman deep down, this is what they say now, don't, don't get it messed up because people try and clip things out. If they say, or someone says, I'm a woman deep down inside, I need to let her out, I need to be able to get surgery to do that, even though the suicide rate isn't something like 80% of people that do that, Re gender reassignment. I need to be able to do that. They want freedom in sin, not freedom in righteousness, which is the gospel. Freedom to be able to do right. Freedom in sin. These two powers. Communism has tried it. Has, it. has it worked? Socialism and social movements are trying to, even to this day, put this stuff forth. Will it work? Everyone wants freedom. Rappers and, me and, and heavy metal people playing songs. They want freedom to smoke marijuana and show all the benefits from it. For instance, this, this health benefits of smoking crack. You say, what? Hey, there's health benefits to something. In other words, when I say health benefits, if it removes a symptom to people's mind, oh, well, that's, uh, that's a benefit. Now, if you have a headache and you smoke crack and it kills you, has it removed the symptom? Do you feel that pain anymore? Well, I guess it's, I guess it's a health benefit then because it killed you so you have no headache anymore. Uh, argument done. Even the most dangerous substance because of the chemical, will react in the body to release some kind of symptom, even if it's aggressive, and even if it causes a cancer. Or so. Brothers and sisters, we can't take the idea of liberty in sin, or liberty to sin, as religious liberty, or human rights. However, as we continue going on, even though this is so, as Christians, as though they have the Spirit of God upon us, we have a work to set the captives free. But if we hate them, to proclaim liberty, but we don't want to be around them. You see the, see the problem here? But we have supposedly, or claim to have the spirit, but we have a lack of the spirit to have even the idea or the, the impetus to go and interact or try and offer one's love and compassion and disinterested benevolence to individuals that they might see something in us or see love or see some type of, of drawing by the Spirit of God and be changed. Human rights that you withhold from someone is a human rights that you lose as well. Someone once said, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. You let someone be abused, you're opening yourself to be abused. Now should you help someone because you just don't want to be abused? No, but if you allow evil to progress, it will eventually come back to you. You reap, the Bible says, what you sow. But these individuals will offer the idea of freedom when they are in bondage. What does the book of John 8 say? John 8, 31, 32, and then 34 through 35. It says that the Son makes you free or what? Free, free indeed. And the Jews said, we, have, we are Abraham's children. We've never been in bondage to any man. Jesus said, he that committed sin is a servant of sin. Under sin, you are in bondage. I don't care about Abraham. If you commit sin, if you're under sin, then you're in bondage. We need freedom. That's the foundation of all rights and freedom and luxury and liberty. We can't offer something or in a, a, a idea of a movement or even a so-called protest, try to bring about principles that don't have the gospel at its foundation. If we are supposedly Christians and we are engaging and taking part in protest without the gospel as the foundation and the true principle of the gospel being put forth, are we truly understand the gospel? No. Because we have a peculiar protest. We have a protest, yes indeed, but our protest is not like the world's protest. It's not this new manifestation of satanic power. Freedom in sin? Freedom in bondage? Is such a thing? Satan's counterfeit. So how do we know the difference? We must study the Word of God and see the difference between what God does with the Holy Spirit or the Gospel and what is being tr tried to be done through legislation, through social reforms, through, through even spiritualism. You know, God says, hey, here's this health message, here's all the principles, here's the Bible, so on and so forth. Go and do it. 
Adventists said, well, you know what? You know, we can't be too, we can't, too fanatical. And while we're over there arguing amongst each other, the Buddhists and, and all the other people run with all this stuff and have all these health food stores. And then when we make up our mind, then we got to go and, you know, buy from the Gentiles. Oh, I'm hungry. Let me, let me, we, we don't have just for you vegan. We don't have uh, Adventists doing it. No, we have to go and get from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dalai Lama Incorporated. <laughs> while we're arguing with each other, who's doing the work? Who's establishing these restaurants? Who's establishing these health food stores? Who's doing the work that we were supposed to do as a special work in the world? While we were arguing over health reform, we got uh, marched on us by the devil in health and in religious liberty line. He's taken back religious liberty and put a false health message out there for the entire world. And we're still arguing. Because we are, by this arguing contention, not studying the word of God for ourselves and being converted, we are ourselves finding ourselves in bondage. In bondage. If you're taking notes, I want you to write down a few things. Let's, let's write down some things that we're going to establish today and we're gonna, in, in the various messages we're going to go through, study these principles. Because we don't talk about bondage. Sin brings bondage. Do you agree with that? Yeah. The Bible teaches that. We talk, saw that in Galatians 5.1. Sin brings bondage. Sin is a bonding power. So I want you to write down a few things under the heading of bondage. Write the word bondage in big letters. And I want you to write down one or the other these, let me see how many of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight terms here I want you to write down. Really seven, but I added one because I'm going to put sin on there just for the sake of, of clarity in your mind. Under bondage, I want to write down seven or well, eight things that identify what type of bondage. When we say bondage, bondage can seem to some minds as being uh, nebulous, kind of cloudy. What, what do you mean by bondage? What kind of, practically, what kind of bondage are we talking about? Okay, write down, number one, the bondage, sin. So we're in bondage to what? Sin. Or the world in bondage to sin. Okay? As a result of sin came bondage. When Adam and Eve sinned, they came under the power of Satan. Not only sin itself, but under the power and suggestion of Satan now. That's what Jesus said to him. Who told you that you were naked? Whose words do you have? My words were in you and you were fine. Who gave, whose gospel do you have? Who told you that? Who preached that unto you? Whose words have you received? He didn't say, where would you, you know, who, who was it? He said, what gospel did you get that from? Because obviously you received, an, not another, but there'd be something to trouble you. They don't understand that one. So number one, sin. Next one is self. You say, what? And bondage to self? Oh, yes. We're going to break it down in a moment. Number one is what? Sin. Number two is self. Number three? Selfishness. You say, oh, come on now. Amen. Yeah. Sin, self, and selfishness. Because through self, we have the activities of self. Without self, there could be no selfishness. The action of self is selfishness. <coughs> Next, we have one, number one, sin. Number two, self. Number three, selfishness. Number four, fear. That's a big one. When bondage to fear. Well, I would knock on doors, but, you know, I'm just so, uh, whew, I don't know. <laughs> Penetration says that shyness is a form of selfishness. Hmm. I, I said that too when I read it. Because many people that are shy are really afraid that self would be wounded by the actions that they might take if they had some courage, per se. If I say that, something may, someone may say something and I may be embarrassed. Self. If I say that, you know, they may not like me and I may ruin this relationship. Even though it's true, it's righteous, it's needed. <sighs> selfishness. The root of sin is found in self and selfishness. What's another word for selfishness we find in the Bible? Self with a C. Oh boy. Bible trivia here. Covetousness. Covetousness. The word covetous means selfishness. It's an old English word. But covetousness means what? Selfishness. That's what it means. Selfishness. You want to take your brother's wife. You want to take your brother's ox. You want to take your brother's land. Selfishness. You want to take to yourself that which doesn't belong to you. Sin. Two. Self. Three. Selfishness. Four. Fear. Five, slavery. 
when bondage to another man, bondage through slavery. Now you can say fear is a type of slavery, selfishness is a type of slavery, but you can say almost all these are everything else. They're all interconnected. So number one, sin. Number two, self. Number three, selfishness. Number four, fear. Number five, slavery. Number six, debt. That's a big one. Debt. People say, well, that's not that bad. Okay, well, you know, let's go to Hawaii. Anyone, anyone ready? Well, you know, well, got to work, slavery. I got some bills, debt. What would happen if my boss found out? Fear. One, two, three, four, five, six. Number seven, disease. Disease. Yeah, I would like to go to Hawaii, but you know, uh, I know I can make it, you know. I take my shoes off and TSA and so on. I can't sit in that plane that long. Whereas if we had our health, what would limit us, right? In bondage to disease. Does Jesus have in the gospel a method to deal with all these? Amen. What about number eight, which is death? All these things are a form of bondage. Because guess what? Moses would be alive today if he wasn't in bondage. Is that true? He died, right? What happened to him, though? He was resurrected. And he is, I guess his debt was canceled. You didn't get that. But there are many in the grave that are waiting for their debt to be canceled. Has it been canceled? Christ did pay the debt. But they haven't got their receipt yet, per se. When Jesus pronounces that word, when he comes out with a shout, with a, shout, with a voice of the archangel, all the dead in Christ shall, even though we may be sick or we may be dying, and we may die, that debt, that, that, that bondage that we're in, even in Christ, that still has some effect upon us, cannot hold us down. We will only rest in the grave for a moment. Only for a moment. Because the gospel deals with all these. But these are the means by which we are held in bondage. Now, why did I write down, or have you write down all these things? Because we want to examine them. And examine them, we kind of close down this message and give us a first installment, a foundational installment of this idea of religious liberty. We need two things to really study this carefully. Let's examine something. Look at the book of 1 John. We understand sin, self, and selfishness. Why do we have to understand this sin, self, and selfishness as a part of religious liberty and understanding the nature of sin and even the victory through true gospel work, even along religious, li religious liberty lines? Because we must understand that the root of sin is selfishness. The root of sin is what? All sin basically springs from the fallen nature, and the fallen nature is selfish. And that's why we come to talk about self. Our worst enemy is self, because where sin has power in the fallen nature. Let's, let's prove something from the Bible. In the book of 1 John, let's look at the scripture. 1 John chapter 2. Look at how the Bible sums up all evil, or all that's in the world. 1 John chapter 2, reading verse 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Look at the Word of God identifies and kind of sums up all that's in the world, all that's evil. How does it sum it up? Notice what it says here. And we're going to see how this Bible defines it. In 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, the Bible says, Love not what? The world. The world. Neither the things that are in the world. So we're talking about the world and what? The things in the world. The theories, principles, methods, items, <coughs> activities. Love not the world, nor the what? So it's dealing with everything that has enmity with God. Can you see that? Amen. Prayerfully you can. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Strong statement, right? Verse 16. For all that's in the world, listen carefully, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of What do we see keeping on re being repeated there? Lust, right? And the world, verse 17, passes away, and the lust. lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. ever. Lust. The whole idea of what's in the world, both the world and the things therein, is tied inseparably with the idea of lust. Without lust, all things in the world have no power over us. 
Without lust, the things of the world had no power over us. If God can destroy po the power of lust through the gospel, we can have life and life more abundant. But what is this lust that is the, the active agent in the commission and the activity of sin? Again, look at the definition here in the book of Romans 7. This is a powerful scripture when you put them together. Romans 7. What is this lust? Romans, the seventh chapter. Romans, what chapter are we looking for? Seven. Romans 7 and verse 7. Romans 7, 7. This, you should be able to remember, remember that, memorize it. Romans 7, verse 7. When someone says, well, you know, how do you say that, that, that selfishness is the foundation of sin? That, I mean, how could all the commandments be broken through selfishness? I'm going to show you right now. Because all that's in the world that's against God and His love is tied up with this lust. And Romans 7, 7 says, what shall we say then? Are we there? Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known what? Sin, but by the... For I had not known... Listen carefully. I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not... Covenant. Lust? Covenant. What's coveting? Selfish. Lust. Selfish. Coveting is not just selfishness, but coveting is, by definition, lust. Paul said, I would have never known what lust was, 1 John chapter 2. Except the Lord said, Thou shalt not covet. All that's in the world comes through coveting. The breaking of all commandments are impossible without coveting because guess what? It's easy to kill someone if you're not selfish. If you're not selfish, it's easy to kill someone and take someone's life from them. Is it easy if you're not selfish? If you're selfish, is it easy to take someone's life? Give me that. Mm. Oh, you said something I don't like? I'm going to take your life from you. I'm going to take your wife, I'm going to take your, I'm, and I'm going to rob you. This is my money now. Take wives of all that I choose. This is the spirit before the flood, where there was violence everywhere. Will you lie to someone? Take truth from them? If you're selfless, if self is dead? Will you forget your mother and your father if you're selfless? See again, unless we understand the gospel and the work of the gospel, we can't understand or even see the need or the, the power of human rights or religious freedom or how that we must interact with our brothers. What is lust? Coveting. And coveting is just selfishness. All the commandments are broken through selfishness. Adultery, taking the name of the Lord in vain, Breaking the Sabbath, it all becomes selfishness. You know, I want to do my pleasure on the seventh day. Speak my own words. You get the idea. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, if this is true, then does the Bible show us from the scriptures how this, this selflessness or how this gospel worked out in man from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation? Do we see this principle being worked out in the earth through his people? Yes, but we have not carefully looked at it or examined it. So when now as we look at the scripture, let's see if we can see this all throughout and see these principles clearly shown to us that we can have this type of selflessness and understand that when Jesus said that he came because the Spirit of God is upon him to preach this liberty, basically when we understand all these scriptures together, if this liberty comes through the Spirit of God, are you following me? Liberty comes through what? The Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God gives liberty to individuals that they can have liberty or power from sin. And if sin, all sin is wound up in covetousness, what does the power of the Holy Spirit in the gospel destroy? Covetousness. Covetousness. To destroy the power that's in the world through lust. That's what Peter says, isn't it? You know, I wish you could destroy the power that's in the world through lust. That's why grace and peace and power is given to us. Because without destroying lust or destroying selfishness, Jesus came into the world to destroy selfishness. And by destroying selfishness, sin, because if you just destroy sin and say, okay, I'm destroying all, I'm going to destroy Satan. Guess what? In our nature is still the principle of selfishness. He had to not only destroy Satan, which would be done at the time, and destroy his power, but that power was 
in humanity, because the Holy Spirit that he had must be given to us, that through the Spirit of God, self can be destroyed. Even daily. I die how often? Daily. daily. Selfishness. Oh, you know what? Oh, another Sabbath. I need to go and set up all these lights. Oh, man. I'm going to call Philip. Let Philip do it. Come on. Philip, hey, why don't you... Well, I can say, hey, get up and do it. Selfishness. Because, again, to minister means to be a servant. To give. Their time. Oh, man. I'm going to go and travel and see the world. Did God tell you to do that? Or is that what self said to do? Did God say to stay in one place and create a library of sermons that people, if you die, could continue to have it? Or do you want to go and go to Germany and go to Africa and so on? Oh, oh man, you pay for it? Oh, I'll be there. Philippines, yeah, I'll come in. It might seem good. People say, oh, this brother's everywhere. But it actually was selfishness. It's not God's will. It was your will. So when we look at the scriptures, brothers and sisters, let's examine that God surely showed us that this power was all throughout the scriptures, the principles of righteousness. Look at, the, look at all the way in the back of the Bible, in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 19. Now you say, what could be in Leviticus? It's talking about wiping your hands and killing turtle doves and bulls. And, uh, what could possibly be there? In Leviticus 19, also the principles of righteousness. The principles of religious liberty. Leviticus 19 and verse 18. What are human rights? What's the rights of all men? All men, good and bad. Leviticus 19 and verse 18 says this. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Thou shalt not avenge, retaliate, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor how? As thyself. As thyself I am the Lord. You shall love your neighbor as what? As thyself. Hmm. Love your neighbor as yourself. So I need to love all of you as I do myself? Hmm. Because I, I'm sure that we would, I would not talk about myself like I talk about other people. <laughs> you know that John Kofi, that brother is so worthless, boy. I tell you, he is. Oh, this brother, he, did you see? Oh, this brother here. Man. Oh, man. You ever talk about yourself like that? Do unto others as you would want someone to do to you. Basically it says, again, let's read it, verse 18. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Remember the story in the New Testament where the question was asked, well, who is my neighbor? You missed that. They tried to make it seem as if, well, you know what, yeah, I hear you talking about, you know, um, Christian, you know, people in the church, but, you know, which, who is really my neighbor? Oh, only, only the people, only the older people. Only the people that have good jobs. Only the people that dress good. Only the people that are, are eloquent. Only the people that do this. Only the people that, you know, that bring me some, uh, you know, uh, uh, pineapple upside down cake. Love thy neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Who is my brother? Who? Who shall I give the same love that I give to myself. The Bible said no man at any time hates his own flesh. But do we love one another with the gospel love? How can we love like that? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Without the Spirit of God, can we love one another? Can we offer anyone human rights? Can we jealously guard the name and character, represent, rep uh, uh, reputation, and even possessions of others? Sister, sister won't mind if I take this little doll out here. She's going to put in the offering anyway. Come on. I need to get her back on the bus. Man, where's my tithe and offering? Nearer my God to thee. Nearer. Brothers and sisters, it says, love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Did Jesus love us as himself? What did he give to keep us from death? I've set you this example, he said, right? Look at Matthew 7. He said, oh, that's, a, that's just the Old Testament. That's, we don't have to do that anymore. We can't talk about people bad. Matthew says this. Matthew 7 and verse 12. You see, we can't 
go into geopolitics and talk about all the various different human rights abuses of the latter days unless we understand what the gospel says about these principles, can we? Matthew says it, Matthew 7. Matthew 7 and verse 12. This is a powerful one. You see, I'm sure you read this, Matthew 7 and verse 12. It says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. What did Jesus say? All the law, the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, which is all the Bible except for the New Testament, is summed up in doing unto others exactly what you'd have them to do to you. In other words, that's called equality. Because everything you have, if you allow others to have it, if everything that you want, you allow others to desire it, if everything you want to possess, you allow others to possess it, if you do unto others character and name, what you do to others, brother sister, that's called equality. And human rights, according to the word of God, according to the creator of all men, basically saying that God holds these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. This is what the scripture teaches. Jesus said, all the Lord prophets show this truth. Do unto them, or as you'd like men to do unto you, do so unto them. Give people equal right. You're talking about homosexuals? No, no. You're talking about church people, right? You must also love people, no matter what their sin, no matter what they do, you must love them. Sin does not disqualify someone from human rights. And this person, this per you know what this person is? This person is nasty. This you know what? Ah, oh, ah. Oh. I can't love this person. I can't love this person. I can't be kind to this person. I can't give this person civility. I can't give this person my cup to drink. Well, if you do, burn it. I can't give this person food. I can't give it. The Bible says, I am the Lord. Jesus said, I am the Lord. This is my child too. Remember the story of the prodigal son? The son said, you know, I've been here with you all this time and you haven't given me a, a calf to, to serve it all my, you know, he was upset that this one that had been lost had been found. He was upset that he had left sin. He was upset that he came back and they rejoiced that he had been recovered. He had, was upset because he had been set free from sin. He had religious liberty. He had accepted the power of the Spirit of God to get human rights. And his brother in the very same church that he was in was upset that he had the same rights that he had. He thought he had more. <clears throat> Matthew 7 and verse 12. Therefore all things whatsoever ye should men should do unto you, do ye even so to them, for in this is what? Law. All the law and the prophets. What are other men's rights? The same as ours. Do you like to be spoken evil of? Hurt? abused, physically, spiritually. Do you, do you like that? Do you do it to others? Do you like people to yell at you? Don't yell at other people. Now, if they yell at you, hey, that's between them and their God. But if you have asked the Holy Spirit to be with you, you can't return. That's what the Bible says, don't avenge and retaliate. If the Spirit of God, because if the Spirit of God is in you, you're setting the captives free. I'm not knocking them into prison. Well, I'll, I'll, you better, you, don't, you better hope, you hope I'm in the blood. I'll put my religion down and take it back up again. You better hope I'm converted. You ever hear the people say that? Yeah. Mercy. So, brothers and sisters, as we go through this, are we seeing the gospel and these principles of human rights and religious liberty inseparable? But, but the Bible is, is even more clear than that. Look, look at James 1. We say, oh, you know, how do we know someone's a real good Christian? Oh, if he keeps the Sabbath. Isn't that the first thing people say? You keep the Sabbath. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, of course, you know, if he, uh, if he, you know, you know, speaks of God, you know, then he's, he's a good person. How does God estimate a man's religion? By how we serve God and how we keep the Sabbath, how we don't take the Lord's name in vain? Okay. James 1. What book are we looking for? How does God estimate? Not the, how, the, how the church, how people... How you and I, have mercy, estimate. Someone came in, boy, I tell you, if, if President Obama took his vacation and came and said, you know what, I'm going to go see what COVID's doing. You know, people don't say he looks like me, I don't know. Just go down and see what COVID's doing. Secret Service came in, walked in, 
Everyone would be, you know, taking selfies. The whole Sabbath would be destroyed. Everyone get a picture, everyone get an autograph. Yes, no? Yeah, we'll see. Because he has money and power and prestige. And when he comes in, you know, oh, 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 you know, dun, 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 you know, just, you know, the music up playing, throw the red carpet out, Secret Service coming in. But, you know, little brother Smith comes in, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> looking for a seat. He's back to 10, 10 minutes. <laughs> yes, pastor, go in and preach. This brother's over here late. Brother Smith walks in, you know, oh, let me not get him a cheer. Let me not you know, share with him, my Bible with him. God forbid he, you know, sits in and hears the gospel and is converted. God forbid that that I think that me getting this message is more important, not more important than, um, no, 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 no. Because my religion is based upon how much knowledge I have and how people see me outwardly is not based upon how I treat him. Jesus said that's the all the law and the prophets. Your Christianity is not based upon in the Bible sense, in this New Testament sense, in the scriptural sense of how you keep the Sabbath. You said, no, no, it has to be. Well, I'm not saying it's not. But God really interprets how your religion, or what your religion is, or if it's valid or not, by how you treat your brothers. I'm going to prove it to you. James 1.27. James 1 what? 1.27. It says, pure religion. Pure religion. Now, the all type of religion. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit what? The church. Visit the general conference and take some pictures, right? Visit the fatherless. And widows in there. We don't want to visit them in their affliction. Why? They might want something from me. Man, I got to pay my rent today. I, mm -hmm. Whoa. I'll, I'll visit you on the second of the month. I'll visit you. I'll visit you now, I won't visit you on you know the thirty first, the thirtieth. You know, I'll visit you after you paid your bills. Visit them in their affliction. It says, and to keep himself unspotted. From the world. So, unspotted from the world means no sin, right? But again, the first part is dealing with our brothers, doing a work for our brothers. First John again comes back and says, even, he says even more stronger language. In First John 4, Jesus says, You are not a Christian if you don't love your brother. If you don't demonstrate, if you, your Christianity is shown you're demonstrating this love. And what kind of love? It's called equality. First John, let's do that. First John. 1 John 4.20, another one we should memorize. 1 John 4.20 says, if a man say, 1 John 4.20, if a man say, I love God, and hateth what? <laughs> now, didn't you say if you call someone a fool, you, you've killed him? You've hated him if you call him a fool. Be careful what you say. If you say you love God and hate your brother, you are a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother <clears throat> also. That's God's commandment, that we love our brother also. But again, who is our brother? You would say, well, you know, <clears throat> it's only the church people, right? Only the church people. I gotta love the church people. But outside there, these dirty pagans, hmm, can't wait to the time of trouble. I, you know, I, <coughs> I often wonder when we are in a rush. Oh, I can't wait for this to be over. Now again, I can understand the, the trial and temptation of this world, but if the world ended today, how many people would be lost? Because again, self says, you know what, I am tired of this struggle. Day by day, I don't want my children to grow up and have to deal with all of this. This stuff does not, it just seems like the storm clouds are coming. But who will save all these people? Well, how is this great multitude going to come in unless someone stands and loves their brother? Loves them as themselves. Proclaims liberty to them. That they may have the right to not be beaten physically, through words, all that they could be cared for, they could be loved, they could be given the opportunity to hear truth. 
in Matthew 25 and verse 40, Jesus said, As much as you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. What you do to your brother shows what you believe about God, or who your God is. Whether it's the prince of darkness or the prince of light. No matter what we profess, or what our church membership says, or what we say that our books on the shelf, brothers and sisters, what we do to other people. Our desire to win souls, to help people, and not win souls just by sophistry and books and so on, but by Christian character. We can't talk about love when we're angry. Turn to John. John 17. Yeah. If you love me, are you listening? If you love, can we show forth the fruit of the Spirit? If the Spirit of God is upon us. You see, because without this, this, this foundational point, this power can't trickle out of the home from the heart and out of the heart into the community and affect laws and kings and kingdoms and like the Protestant Reformation did, completely change the, the, the structure and fabric of society. This is what stopped the old world order from hastening greatly and even being accomplished. But again, we're in a time where the love of many or this love that we see as true religion shall wax what? Let's close.